But it turns out, for the reason I described, that um, indeed it uh, became a way he could guarantee uh, the right uh, position uh, of the groups he was adding to build up that molecule. How did he do it? Well, if we go back to the previous slide, all he did was it's easy to introduce a double bond to the standard thing anywhere in for a double, uh, single bond. And he could do it by put, and put a big bulky group on one side uh, here. And then um, it, when he added something to the double bond to go back to the single bond configuration he wanted, of course, he would have to add on the left side that wasn't blocked by the bulky, bulky side. So just knowing that configuration, that the hydrogen here would eclipse the double bond, told him he could in this very simple way. So he did that 72 times. Now, that sounds easy, just hard work. But in fact, as many people sitting in this audience know, with a big molecule like this, whenever you use some reagent, you have to protect a lot of other sites you don't want that reagent to do things with. So you have to build a lot of scaffolding and so on. So I say what he did in this synthesis, and many other chemists do that, is something like composing a Beethoven symphony. Each note in the symphony is very simple, just as you know, each bond is pretty simple here. <laughs> but putting them all together in the right way, that seemed impossible. But we celebrate it with Beethoven. We should celebrate it with Kishi. It turns out this method opened up a huge number of, of opportunities to get stereospecific syntheses from many, many other molecules that had been thought completely out of range. So that's the, the first parable. I think you can draw the lessons, the moral, if you like, of the story from that, that a key bit of information, even about a little small molecule, can have this huge impact not just in making a particular big molecule, but a whole field of synthesis, just from that one thing. It's such a simple thing uh, that I think it's a nice parable. So the second one might interest you more. I, you may, did, may have noticed the title. Anyone notice? Maybe not. OK. The second one is sex in the single methyl group. Again, methyl group plays the action. Uh, back in the early 60s, a book called Sex and the Single Girl was published uh, by Helen Gurney Brown. She became immediately famous because in the first three months, it sold two million copies. Every young woman I was acquainted with then got this book. Actually, it was a very, book filled with practical information for sex and the single girl. But the sex was only in one chapter. All the rest was pragmatic things about cooking, housekeeping, <laughs> all sorts of things. But anyway, it was a great seller. So naturally, I thought of this for the title, or related to the title of Sex and the Single Methyl Group, because um, uh, it's a fascinating story that only developed recently. Uh, as you all know, our species has two categories of people that are very important uh, in many ways. Uh, we also often say men and women and so on, but I think it's better to say XX people and XY people, because as you'll see in a moment, they can get mixed up. <laughs> now, uh, first we'll speak about the XY people. We have quite a few here. Uh, for the first 35 days in the womb, uh, an XY fetus is indistinguishable from an XX fetus by anything you can see by ultrasound or whatever. That is, in terms of anatomy, there's no clues yet. But around the 35th day, if everything works properly, genetic switch operates and uh, the fetus, if it's an XY fetus, uh, has uh, nascent uh, female structures fade away and male ones develop and you get the usual thing, a boy baby. However, that switch fails once in 50 to 100,000 
time, cases. More or less fails with a probability of, I wrote 10 to the minus 5, but that's one part in 100,000. Not very often. However, <laughs> when it does fail, uh, the fetus, the XY fetus, is viable, is born, healthy baby, but totally female in anatomy, infertile female. Now think of some of the consequences of that. Uh, first, before we go into that, maybe I should say the reason that fails uh, when it does, not very often, fortunately for the XY members of the audience, uh, it simply replaces as a methyl group uh, that's replaced by hydrogen on a particular amino acid, a particular one, just one. And that shortens the side group on a gene that's called SRY gene. That's on the Y chromosome. And it's supposed to be the sex determining gene. The Y chromosome, incidentally, is a very miserable little thing. There are only 35 genes on it, whereas the X chromosome has two or 3,000 genes. So um, you can begin thinking a little about that. But um, if, if that one methyl group is missing in the XY fetus, you'll get a female, uh, an, a, a baby with female anatomy. And this is just for the chemists here. There are a few. Uh, on the left side is the, uh, the amino acid that results when you lose the top methyl group on the isoleucine. So it's replacing the isoleucine by a valine, a mistake. Uh, so that's all it is. One methyl group is a difference. All right? Now, uh, you all have heard the advice that you should give your children information about the birds and the bees, right? How many of you have done that? A few? I don't see any hands up. Because I'm pretty sure you don't tell them about the bees. Birds do produce somewhat like mammals. There's some important differences, like birds use eggs and are emerging, not, not kicking babies instead. But bees, they don't reproduce anything like mammals. They have, as you know, an infertile worker class. So. If the methyl group were missing more often on that one amino acid, then the XY members of our species would be an infertile working class, right? Like the bees. So that's the difference between us and the bees, a methyl group. <laughs> now, there's some biologists who think that actually the Y chromosome has gotten, this is a speculation, over time, smaller. It's lo lost more and more genes, and it might actually disappear altogether eventually. Long time from now, probably, if it does. I hope it doesn't happen, of course. But uh, when I talk about this, it was discovered and established through NMR, mag Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Study, incidentally. Um, sometimes I see the ladies smiling a bit thinking that, gee whiz, if that methyl group in the future is uh, missing more often, uh, we'll have uh, a different kind of attitude in the part of the XY members of our society or so on. However, ladies, you all have two X, almost all of you, I think, two X chromosomes. And the fact is that if certain genes were, as the biologists say, fully expressed or fully active, on both X chromosomes, you would not be viable. You would be producing too much of some critical uh, enzyme or protein that regulates other things in such a way that your biochemistry would be completely killed and knocked out of whack. So what do you have to do? What did nature have to do? You want to guess from the title? You have to attach a methyl group. You attach a methyl group, that's what it done. It inactivates the gene. That's all it takes, a methyl group. So the methyl group has a vital role for the XX part of our species, as well as 
for the x, y. Uh, now, one more remark about it. Uh, if you compare rather famous molecules, testosterone and estrogen, you will notice that except for the bottom left part of it, left from our point of view, it's the same molecule. It's the same molecule. In fact, the change uh, going from estrogen to testosterone really involves adding a methyl group, which takes away a double bond that estrogen has. And the difference, in fact, between the double bond O and the OH, uh, between testosterone and estrogen, actually a, a form. You can have both forms, as you know, as chemists. So that's not so significant. So really, the major significance is adding a methyl group to go from estrogen to testosterone. So what is the moral of that parable? The moral certainly is, gee whiz, something as seemingly insignificant is a methyl group. I mean, methyl group is like a penny. You know, you have zillions of methyl groups on most sizable organic molecules. But so important to have them in the right place. What a difference it makes. Or in the wrong place, depending on your point of view. So that's the second parable. Uh, the third one uh, is similar in character, but uh, totally happy. Uh, it gives you um, a story, uh, quite incredible. Uh, again, something that only a few years ago would have been regarded as impossible. That's a common theme in these three parables. Uh, Professor Chao Wei Sheng at Harvard uh, has done uh, many brilliant things, but the most brilliant, by all accounts, is to give our, our uh, species what amounts to uh, a new set of eyes. Such powerful eyes that you look in and see what is going on inside a single cell, all sorts of complicated chemical interactions we could not imagine doing before. So I wanted to mention it very briefly. Uh, she is definitely an XX member of our species. That's another reason I wanted to mention her brilliant work, uh, because I want to encourage a lot of the XX uh, people here. Uh, and uh, she has, is a, also the mother of a bouncing baby. Uh, very lovely thing that happened about a year ago. But uh, in her work, she has developed a, what is really called a super imaging microscope uh, that allows you to do this remarkable business. And how did she do that? Up, upstairs in this picture is uh, the best you can do with a conventional uh, my, microscopy, uh, looking in a cell, a particular cell, we don't need the details. Those green things are what are called microtubules, and there are other little things called clathrin pits and so on. We don't need to know about the details, what they represent exactly, except they're sizable structures. Uh, uh, the resolution you can get by the best conventional means of microscopy and looking at cells and living things is the order of between 200 and 500 or 800 nanometers. A nanometer is a billionth of a meter. So I don't have much hair to spare, but if I take one hair, its width is 1,000 nanometers. For those of you who are, aren't calibrated in nanometers already, 1,000 nanometers is the width. And the best conventional one can only resolve something 800 to 300 or so nanometers. <laughs> Her technique uh, improves the resolution to between 10 and 20 nanometers. Huge, huge change. So much so that it enables her to actually identify various molecular species and other structures within cells and follow in real time what they're doing. That's really astonishing. So she can literally make movies of the intimate inner life going on inside our cells. 
we have a lot of cells. We all have, I think, something 13 trillion cells. But she only has to look at one or two in a particular kind of, uh, any particular kind of organ, to learn a great deal about what actually goes and functions inside the life of that cell, uh, which is something we can never do before or even imagine doing. So she, that's the sense in which she's provided new eyes. How does she do it? Well, uh, for some time now, maybe 15 years or so, there's been tremendous uh, benefit from uh, some work developed by Roger Chisson. He received the Nobel Prize for this for some time ago, uh, for uh, developing fluorescent labels, that is, uh, little molecules, not terribly big ones, that you could attach to particular sites in bigger molecules that had the right chemistry to accept them, and they had this property that they fluoresce, that is, you illuminate them with the right light, you usually use a laser light because it's so convenient and uh, high resolution, and it will emit certain radiation, certain frequencies. That's what fluorescence is. You, you excite it with other light and then it emits. And so she uh, had the idea of, gee, if she attached a number of these different uh, fluorescent labels, and use different la uh, lasers and so on, she could take the fluorescence spectra and, and computer, combine it, and generate this uh, kind of mic microscopy. So it's a computer-aided method. You couldn't do this really without a computer and without the lasers. So one of the clear lessons from this parable is science is a tool-driven thing. Uh, sometimes students have the impression from their courses and all that, oh gosh, uh, our predecessors had it easy, they discovered all these nice things, what's left for us? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, what you don't recognize is uh, you inherit a legacy of tools that your predecessors often couldn't even imagine existed, much less, and pretty soon you can do things that totally bond beyond what any of your predecessors could imagine. So that's the key thing I want to stress about this story. So I won't take time to go into the details here. I would recommend very much looking at her, her uh, website. 